welcome John to our Himsa Conversations. Uh, what is your earliest memory of uh, non-violence, of Ahimsa, either as an idea or as an experience? Hmm. Rajni, it's wonderful to be in conversation and I'm, I'm really looking forward to the uh, process. It's odd. I don't, I, I often, when I'm thinking of, uh, of, of my life, do not think particularly in terms of non-violence. I think of t in terms of violence. And let me tell you why. I grew up in a military family uh, and we traveled to parts of the world where there tended to be quite a lot of violence, some of it going back a very long time. So Northern Ireland and Cyprus and Israel and so on in the 1950s. So I, you know, I, I was often thinking about what is it that brings people to war, to conflict, to religious wars, to civil wars and so on. And I was fascinated as a child by that because when you have these periods of conflict, and we're very close, I think, to it now in different parts of the world, you see um, <clears throat> a society, a culture, almost as in an X-ray. Now, it was only in the 1960s that I became uh, aware of the, the nonviolence um, uh, agenda and, and uh, the movements associated uh, with that. So to your question, what was my, my earliest memory of non-violence. I think in part it was just a revulsion of what I saw in terms of violence. So in Northern Ireland, for example, it would have been Protestants versus Catholics, but also at the same time when I was very young, six, seven, um, I was taken to not just farms but a slaughterhouse and I saw what was done to animals in the pursuit of uh, food and th that absolutely shamed me and I just, I, I, but it was inarticulate. I wasn't thinking, you know, in, in these circumstances, Mahatma Gandhi would, would do X, Y, or Z. It just, that wasn't part of the discourse in my brain. I was just, I was appalled at what um, I saw. So I think there was an appetite uh, for nonviolence. But just finally, if I think about first memories, the, I was thinking just the other day, I, I had a very powerful memory uh, which turns out to have been from when I was about 18 months old. And I put it, I, I remembered it in the wrong place. So I, I, I remembered it as happening in Northern Ireland, but actually it happened in uh, west of London. I was born on a, a little island in the Thames in a, an old uh, mill uh, cottage. And I remembered this almost Amazon-like braiding of rivers and streams and waterfalls and so on. And when I talked to people about, was that near the farm we lived on in Northern Ireland? I was told, no, there was nothing like that. And then my wife Elaine and I went to where I was born and it was exactly that. It was, and, and there were kingfishers and there were fish in the river and there were eight or nine different tributaries and streams and so on, all coming together and the constant sound of uh, water. And I suddenly realized that was probably the most profound influence on my life. And yet that was from when I was 18 months old. I mean, it's an extraordinary uh, thing how the memory sometimes works. And then later in life, when you became interested in the environment, mm. perhaps these childhood memories informed your interest and your care for the environment? Was there a connection? I think there was a very strong connection. And I often, um, go back to when I was six and um, again in Northern Ireland we lived on a farm although my my, my father was still in the Air Force and um, I, I remember every Tuesday I used to go out on my own to have um, supper an evening meal with um, one of the farm laborers who was Irish and who was Catholic and we were meant to be Protestant um, and I would love that I, I, I love those um, uh, meals. I, why my parents allowed it, I don't know, because when I came back, I was on my own. I, it was completely dark. There was no moon. I was in walking across a field with um, old flax ponds in it, so where they used to grow um, the plants to create uh, fibers. Um, and I suddenly found myself completely surrounded by tens of thousands of eels, baby eels, elvers. And I just had one of these moments of absolute panic you know it was existential and also of incredible connection and and i think that 
really stayed with me. And what then happened the next day, um, I only know because I, my, my mother told me uh, what happened, was I went into the Catholic convent school where I was a student and there were three Protestants out of uh, a Catholic population. That Catholic population was embedded in a Protestant community, Protestant community really tough uh, on the Catholics. And we, as the three Protestants, got beaten up every day for three years, not thinking about it. I mean, just, it was the way it was. And I was you know, often quite happy. But that morning afterwards, I went in to talk to, um, I, I, I talked to the mother superior. I, I can't remember whether I was six or seven, but, um, and I told her what had happened. And I said, you know, mother superior, do animals go to heaven? And she became absolutely furious. And I've, I've met two other people since who've had the same um, uh, experience. And in the Catholic Church, at least, it seems that the idea that animals other than human beings um, uh, would go to heaven and, and it is just complete anathema. And she became so angry that you know, I have a very visual imagination. And I still remember what happened in my brain, which was, well, firstly, she said, uh, she she didn't she thought I was either a pagan or a pantheist and she didn't know which was worse and that's the bit I only remember because I told my mother and I said what do those words mean um, but I just had this mental image in my brain of fingers coming through a red curtain and tearing and all the religious faith that I'd had up to that um, point just went out of the window so to your question did this sort of link to later environmentalism Absolutely. I think in many ways, my love for the natural world, uh, I mean, not that it isn't full of, full of horrors too, but, but I, I love nature, I love the planet, and uh, I think that's where it came from, because in many ways, I think environmentalism shares really key characteristics of a religion. I mean, it's something bigger than us, the planet, something that goes on long after us. It's about sort of uh, afterlives, but not in heaven. It's afterlives in terms of not only human beings, but you know every species, and I think it's it sort of filled that sort of um, <laughs> vacuum which was created in that minute. And the mother superior had no idea whatsoever what she was uh, had just done. There is a common impression that nature itself is full of violence, and that argument is often used to justify or explain away yeah, human yeah. violence, um, but. You have in your work, in different ways, demonstrated that nature is not primarily about violence. So could you say more about that? Well, I think, I think the um, nature seems to be about creating the conditions for more life, life creating the conditions for more life. But individual species and individual communities within species do not actively think for the most part about how they create the conditions for more life and particularly the conditions for more uh, life among other species. It just happens to be an emergent property of what um, uh, happens. And I think um, one of the big moments of insight for me was probably when I was about 19 or 20 and I was reading the work of two brothers, American brothers, the Odom uh, brothers, Howard and Eugene, and they looked at ecosystems and they looked at sort of what are called trophic or energy levels within ecosystems. And they made a comparison between a, a coral reef and, and a city, for example, like Hong Kong, and just looked at the way those systems uh, worked. And I, later on, I became a, a, a trained as a city planner. And I think that moment was the moment where I suddenly realized that life organized itself in some fairly standard uh, patterns over time, and we should understand those and not do violence to those. But within those patterns, within those dynamics, within those flows and processes, violence happens routinely because things have to eat other things in order to survive, in order to feed their uh, young. And um, in, here in Britain, which is where I'm based, I live in London, there has been a three-week television series, which uh, I've watched absolutely avidly. It's called Spring Watch, and it takes you into nature, and they have cameras on. They're reintroducing beavers into the country, so on beaver dams. They have uh, cameras on, on bird nests of all sorts of different uh, types. And 
it's absolutely fascinating to see that but you do notice that everything coming back to the nest is carrying something else which probably on balance didn't want to die and didn't want to be eaten um so I understand why people may have uh, taken Darwin's notion that, or, or Hobbes's notion that, that, that nature is violent in, in, in tooth and claw, and uh, and that's intrinsically part of the system. Well, it is, but it doesn't mean that we have to knowingly uh, per, you know, perpetrate violence on others. Where did James Lovelock and the idea of Gaia uh, arrive in your journey? Because I know that's an important uh, landmark in your intellectual journey. <laughs> well, if you can call it an intellectual journey, I mean, I think a bit like you've sometimes described your life's adventure. I, I often feel I've stumbled backwards into things and I, I, I often know what I don't want to do. I don't totally know what exactly what I want to uh, move towards. Um, but James Lovelock came into my world and... and uh, in 1975, I started to write for one of our magazines here in the UK called New Scientist. And it was odd because I'd given up uh, science when I was 14. I, I refused to cut up frogs and animals. And you can't, you couldn't then do biology without doing that. So I, I had to largely abandon science. So I came back to it, started to write about it, uh, science and technology and the environment. And in 1975, uh, James Lovelock did a piece on the Gaia hypothesis, which you will know, it may well be that other listeners don't, but this notion that the planet Earth is akin to an organism. It behaves very much uh, like an organism. And if you look at the atmosphere, just to take one example, there are chemicals that play the role of hormones in the human body and so on. And so he, he started to think like that and talk about that. And he attracted a great deal of anger from people who thought this was anthropomorphic or, or romantic or whatever. What's been extraordinary over time is that um, his thinking has increasingly become mainstream in science. People are beginning to realize that the planet's atmosphere and biosphere and oceans and so on, in, I, have been interconnected in all sorts of ways which we had no idea uh, about. Just finally, um, I then, when I, I, when I, I saw that article in 1975, I thought if I ever have a daughter or if we ever have a daughter, I would like the first one to be called Gaia and Gaia's now I think 41 uh, years old. Um, so he, he has been a big influence and, and wonderfully, I, Elaine and I went to his 100th birthday party um, 18 months, two years ago. And what an extraordinary man he has been. He, he, although I said that was the final thing, just one quickly sidebar. People think about the environmental movement as coming from Rachel Carson and Silent Spring, for example, the book. Um, if you look about where Rachel, back at where Rachel Carson got her uh, understanding of the environment from, a lot of that came from James Lovelock because he, he set up the experiments that identified uh, insecticides as a critical uh, problem for bird life and, and, and all sorts of um, uh, uh, animals and, and, uh, and so on. How did this shape your understanding of the violence in the economic system, the systemic violence, yeah. which is uh, normally uh, we think of it in the human equity sense, which of course is deeply important, but uh, the ex if you could elaborate on how you came to understand the systemic violence of the economic system, which is driving the planet to the brink. So it's, in, in a way, if I can just sort of come up with a sort of uh, a public health care warning or a, or a sort of admission of guilt. Um, you know, my father who died last year, he was um, 98, 99 when he died, and he was a Battle of Britain pilot. So he, he fought in the Second World War. And so for me growing up, that you know, I, I would see the wounds in his legs. I, I would hear, not initially because he didn't talk about it like so many people, but I was just fascinated about what drove these people and why they did what they did. So I grew up with that background. I've already, already referenced it of, the role of the military and, and sort of taking it for granted. But as I started to study 
these wars. And I look back at, for example, somebody like General Eisenhower. We think of him as a great general. We think of his role, for example, in uh, the D-Day invasions of occupied uh, Europe. But then you look at what he did after the uh, war. He, he obviously became president, but one of his most forceful warnings was about the reach and power and malign influence of what he called the military industrial complex. So in the 60s, when I first went, late 60s, I first went to university, that particular university blew up because um, there was this acute consciousness among young people at that stage about what was happening, particularly in Vietnam, Vietnam and the sort of chemical and other industrial uh, combines that were, were feeding into that process with Agent Orange and 245T and all of these sort of really pernicious uh, uh, forms of um, industrial uh, chemistry. So I started to look at um, industry in a rather different way. But I also, from childhood, I was always fascinated about aircraft, with, with aircraft for perhaps obvious reasons, and flight. Uh, and I was interested in the companies, the businesses that put together these remarkable, miraculous um, machines. From an interest in science and technology, I became interested in the people who were creating stuff. I mean, and largely that was business in the late 70s. And then I was invited uh, by one of the founders of the World Wildlife Fund, Max Nicholson, to help set up a new business to monitor what companies were doing. And that's where it really began. I, I, I just, I was nosy, I was curious. I wanted to find out who these people were, what they were doing, how they thought. And I started to go and um, invite myself into companies in different parts of the world. And over about a space of about eight, 10 years, I've probably visited about three to 400 uh, companies in different parts of the world. And it was almost a uniquely privileged uh, perspective that I built up during that period, because most people either weren't interested or didn't get the, the access. And it wasn't hard. It wasn't easy in, in the early years. You just, if you approached a company, you met lawyers and public relations people, and they didn't want you anywhere near their, their, uh, their company. And within 15 years or so, we found that it was almost as a standard that you would meet a director level person, you'd be in, uh, invited in to talk to uh, board members and so on. So it, it, it was a cultural shift where business going from this sort of, don't want to know what you are thinking and don't want to know you either, went to the point, well, okay, maybe you do have some points to make, we'd like to hear those, but we'd actually not rather hear it in, in the, the quiet of the boardroom rather than have you sort of kicking in the door from outside. Where in this journey did cannibals with forks happen? <laughs> it's funny. I was writing that book, and that was 97. Um, right. It was published, so it was 96, 95, 96. Um, and I, I, you know, sometimes a book's title will come um, just in the instant, and, and then everything flows. And other times it's a really damnable struggle. I just one day I sat down with a dictionary of poetry. I love poetry. <laughs> And um, I came across this um, quotation from uh, a, a Polish poet. And what he said was, is it, well, it, it was a question. Is it progress if cannibals learn to eat with forks? And I was talking then about introducing the concept of the triple bottom line. I, I, I coined that in 1994. And this idea that a, a fork has three uh, prongs or tines or whatever, I just thought, oh, well, maybe there's a game I can play there. People since have said, couldn't we have called it cannibals with chopsticks or cannibals with spoons or, or whatever, but that's where the idea came from. And it's been remarkable because um, when I think, I've done now done 20 books and I think of the, maybe there are four or five that really have had an extraordinary impact. And I think that book did. And I think a key part of that uh, and its memorability uh, for readers was in that uh, title. But there was a deeper philosophy behind your coming up with the term triple bottom line. So could you? Well, there may have been. I mean, it was, I mean, I spent, eight, people assume that three words are very easy to get to, but I spent 18 months trying to get to that triple bottom line uh, formulation. And a year later, I came up with People, Planet, Profit, just simply as a way of making it a little bit more uh, memorable. But the, the philosophy, insofar as it was such, um, flowed from a, an unease 
And the unease was around what I saw business doing in terms of understanding or trying to understand the sustainable development agenda. So uh, Grohan and Brundtland uh, and her uh, commission uh, reported out in 1987, they talked about sustainable development. They were already talking about three different dimensions of value, uh, economic, social, and environmental. But I wanted to make that more relevant to business. And um, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, as it's now called, um, was then beavering away with what it called eco-efficiency. How do you make money? How do you make a profit by doing the right thing on environment and resources, by you know, cutting down on waste and saving energy and all of that sort of stuff? Absolutely fantastic. And if you're an engineer, way to go. But I just felt that that left out some big parts of the equation. So fine on profits and financial aspects, but we really did, I thought, have to focus on the economic dimension, but crucially, the social dimension. And, you know, that, that, that includes uh, the whole nonviolence agenda, at least in my mind. And at that time, business really did not want to think about the social side um, of this change agenda. And I, I watched, for example, when Walmart in the United States was hit so hard by Hurricane Katrina in 2005, and they came out of that and they thought, well, we, we must embrace sustainability. But what they, what they basically were talking about was eco-efficiency. They still abused their employees. They still abused local communities of which they were part because that was part of their business model. And to your earlier point about the violence that is intrinsic, hardwired into business, a lot of people embedded in a business model just think this is a Darwinian struggle for survival. And you know, if we kill our competitors, well, that's fine. That's, that, 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 that's the way this game is meant to be played. And if we strip out retail, if you're a Walmart, if you strip out, strip, strip out uh, retail businesses that are competing with you in, in um, local communities, so you can put a much bigger retail operation in, and then you strip out some of the stores that you put in. So some communities are left uh, having to drive uh, to what you're um, still offering. You know, people think that's just the game you're playing, but the but the but the violence that is done to individuals, to communities, and to the environment in the midst of all of this is something that for a long time was not properly considered. Trade unions and so on help some people con consider about employment conditions and health and safety. But I think this in in my working lifetime, so it's forty five years or so, I think I've seen a profound cultural change in at least the biggest, most exposed, uh, branded uh, companies. Doesn't mean that there isn't a lot of um, uh, the even greater problems elsewhere, but they, but they have realized that they've got to change. And, and, and I think finally, the, one of the biggest factors in my experience has been younger people coming up into business at every level and feeling, well, why wouldn't we do that? I mean, that, I mean, the good stuff. Um, so I, I, it sounds, um, strange uh, of sometimes people find it a bit uh, strange but i am an optimist i do think that not only is life improvable and i, I but i also think that uh, business is the engine of our economies economies have a very profound influence on uh, our societies and even on our sense of identity how we think what our priorities are and i think part of what i've been trying to do is get into that business world and understand it enough to think about what levers of change we might use to help you know, advance the causes that other people are trying to push us towards. Mm. And yet, I think two years ago it was that you wrote an article in Harvard Business Review recalling the concept that you introduced <laughs> in the world. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah. You recalled the triple bottom line as a concept. So uh, is that, did that have something to do with how the systemic violence uh, of the economic sphere appears to have in some ways gotten worse in spite of so many companies coming on board or is it something else? <laughs> well, a simple and slightly self-serving answer would be to say, yes, of course. And, and, but it, actually a lot of it was intuitive. And, and um, when I think back to Gandhiji and I think about how he resisted the British Raj and how he used playfulness and humor uh, quite often uh, to provoke uh, you know, people to 
think differently. I would say he was one of the, the, the models of, of some of the stuff that I've done, which is designed to be provocative. I mean, I, I remember many, probably 25 years ago, I was described somewhere as a grit in the corporate oyster. And I quite like that term. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, um, and, and you have to hold human beings. You have to hold yourself under tension in order to evolve, in order to properly consider the lessons uh, that life is trying to uh, teach us. And when I did the recall, I didn't, uh, you can't recall a management concept. Harvard Business Review, the editorial staff there, told me it was the first time uh, any management concept had ever been subject to a product recall, which you know is understood by automotive manufacturers or people who create things with dysfunctions and they have to take them back. Um, but I felt it was a necessary provocation. It turned out to be better received and more timely than I had actually imagined. Um, so it was intuitive, but uh, overwhelmingly, I got extremely positive responses from people saying, actually, it's still a good idea, but we've really got to think about how it's uh, properly and effectively ap ap applied, because at the moment, it's not doing uh, what the original ambition was that it should do, which was to drive systemic change, to, to, to change the nature of economics, the way we value, the way we price, uh, to change almost the genetic code uh, of markets and business. Um, and I think we've now got a proposition that, that, that builds out from that, which I think is quite powerful. But yeah, it, it was intuitive. And I, I can't say, you, you used the word intellectual earlier on. I, I don't feel I'm intellectual at all. I feel that a, a lot of what I do is sort of, it's driven by curiosity. It's, it's absolutely influenced by uh, emotion and, and, you know, am I interested or not? Uh, am I excited or not? In the same period uh, that you've had such a big impact and so many companies have uh, changed the way they do things, uh, yeah. it's also the same period in which we have seen uh, globally an unprecedented concentration of money yeah. power. Yes. And it is in the same 40 years that less, um, uh, actually it's far less than 1% yeah. of the world's population have come to own virtually uh, the overwhelming majority of the wealth. Yeah. And how, what is your hope for the future uh, for the, uh, in a sense, what looks like endemic violence? Yeah. For it to, what are the openings that you see now going forward to change this? Uh, I went to university first time around uh, to study economics and I gave it up in 1968 because it seemed to have nothing, after one year, it seemed to have nothing to do with what was going on in the wider world at that time. But I, I came away, and I've said this often, but I came away with two economists still very much live in my brain, both of them long since dead, but um, one was Nikolai Kondratiev, and the other one was Joseph Schumpeter, and both of them said the same thing, is that economists and you know, the evolution of economic activity do not go in straight lines. There are waves and cycles, and Schumpeter, as you know, talked about uh, cycles of creative destruction. And that has always driven uh, my thinking. So uh, across that, you get new technologies coming in, you get new uh, business models coming in, you get periods of globalization and then deglobalization when people uh, retreat uh, back and very often, in the depths of these cycles, you get conflict, you get major wars. Uh, it's an unfortunate truth. Um, and I, I, you know, the question I've been asked several times recently is, do we think that COVID-19, the pandemic, can play the role that a war would have played in previous cycles? I, my favorite subject always has been history and the future. Um, and I think history suggests that there is something going on at the moment, and it's, it, it's the ending of a period driven by a particular set of technologies, and new ones largely digital coming through, which are disrupting everything of that old order. It's driven by a, a collapse in a geopolitical uh, order, which sort of followed the Second World War, uh, Bretton Woods and all the rest of it. And that's a very dangerous time, because as what we're seeing at the moment is a great unraveling, uh, that, that, that people are increasingly less trusting of institutions, 
you know, I've already declared that I'm sort of an optimist. I don't live on hope, but I do believe that our species, uh, when it backs itself into a corner, that sometimes when its greatest work is done, and I think we have backed, I, you know, I've said it before, but I, we've backed ourselves into the mother of all corners now, and it's partly economic and it's partly social, but critically it's the climate emergency. It's the planet emergency. It's the way in which the web of nature is literally unraveling uh, before our eyes. I mentioned uh, the eels that triggered my sort of, in a way, uh, awakening, and their population in Europe has gone down 99.5% since I had that experience. It's the same in uh, the United States, it's all, or North America, and it's the same in uh, Asia. But just my optimism comes from the fact that I think if you intervene in the right way and you know what you're doing or have some sense of what needs to be done, you can have a quite disproportionate impact. So uh, quite some years ago, uh, my wife Elaine and I went to one of our rivers in the west of uh, England called the Severn, and we released 30,000 eels or baby eels into the uh, river. And that was part of a, 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 um, a campaign by... Um, a group called the Sustainable Eel uh, Group. And what's remarkable af is after 50 plus years now of the absolutely ferocious decline in eel populations, the curve is now bending and you're starting to see a, a greater return rate of uh, eels to uh, Europe, uh, greater survival rate, and hopefully uh, you know, over time, greater breeding. Uh, rates and, and people often turn to me and say why why are you concerned about eels do you love them i don't i mean i <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't embrace an eel but i but i but i recognize and back to the earlier conversation around ecosystems they are keystone species they underpin so many other parts of the ecosystem so many things feed on them uh, that if we lose them we lose so much else uh, at the same time so we've got to put them back there is also eco-fundamentalism, yes. eco-terrorism yes. of driven by people whose rage has led them to believe that they can restore the ecological balance by resorting to violence against other human beings. Um, in light of that energy, what today would you say are the chances of approaching this crisis with nonviolence. What are some of the parameters or what are some of the markers that you would identify to help that uh, quest for nonviolent answers? Well, the first thing to say is, um, you know, if you asked Elaine, my wife, am I a nonviolent person? She would say mainly, but if somebody tries to hit me on my bicycle with their car, I will react quite violently. And, you know, it's happened so many times now. I've been left unconscious four times. I've been left with three broken ribs twice. Um, I don't like people trying to kill me. And when they do, I sort of react. Uh, not, I don't go down and, and sort of um, uh, try and calm them down. I'm, 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 I'm just saying that because, you know, <laughs> I am the individual uh, that I am. But um, last year in London, uh, some of your listeners will uh, perhaps recall, a group of predominantly young people, but with it was multi-generational, Extinction Rebellion uh, came together and they did phenomenal work. They shut down uh, the centre of London or key parts of the centre of London for five or six days. And I was blown away by the way in which they managed to maintain their non-violent discipline. And about five or six weeks before the protest, I'd invited one of the um, uh, organizers of Extinction Rebellion, uh, Gail Bradbrook, to come in and just have a conversation. I, I wanted to know who they were. I wanted to know what they wanted. I wanted to know how they were doing it. And I was so blown away by her. Uh, she was just one of these people who just embraces the world, you know, just exudes love. And, and uh, I fell in love. And, uh, you know, and, and in a way, I think, used in the right way, and I'm not saying nonviolence is simply a tactic, but used in the right way, it can disarm um, the, the, the people who have the potential otherwise to do uh, the protesters violence. Now, I happen to think that that works better in some cultures uh, yeah. than others. Uh, and it's perhaps overstating the claim, but I think uh, Gandhi was lucky in a way with that he wasn't dealing with certain other cultures in 
the playfulness of some of the campaigns that he did. There was still a lot of violence and brutality from the the forces of the, the, the British Empire. But and I think in London, the way that Extinction Rebellion operated appealed. Whereas in, in, in other parts of the world, it mightn't appeal to quite, uh, for example, in China, or, or to take one example, uh, it just, it, it wouldn't. I mean, the, the state power is operated there in a very different way. Tiananmen Square uh, showed that. And um, so I think nonviolence is, has to be central if, if we aim to overthrow the existing order through violence, we simply tr trigger a set of reflex actions where we, we, we almost accentuate some of the problems that we're trying to um, address. And just again, finally, I, in the late 60s, I, I went to university and, and somebody I knew quite well uh, ended up in prison for 10 years. Uh, she tried to blow up British government ministers. Uh, she's now dead. Her name was Anna Mendelssohn. She joined something called um, the Angry Brigade. And also in, in, in Germany, I, I turned out to know two people who were part of the support group of the Baden-Meinhof gang or group or whatever you call a Red Army faction. Um, and they, among other things, they killed the father of somebody I know moderately well now in Berlin. I didn't know her then, but, and I, I've often looked back to the, back and thought, what was going on there? And I think my, my simple interpretation is that these were bright, university-trained young people who saw what was going on in the world and wanted to change it. If you ask them, they would say, typically, we tried to change the system by using the current channels, didn't work. So we thought if we shot some people or uh, bombed people, then they'd pay attention. I think we've been remarkably lucky to date that the younger generations have not responded in like manner. I think there is anger growing. I think there's frustration growing. And I think we have a very short time window in which to engage younger people and give them hope and give them purpose. And, you know, it, not giving them, I mean, in a the sense, they, they, they bring it, but enabling them to, to, to uh, make that um, a central part of, of what we do in our economies and societies. So I, 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 I think we've all got an immense amount to learn from the practitioners uh, of nonviolence. But history also suggests that there are moments where only violence, and this will not be welcome, but only violence will rock the certainties of the incumbent uh, powers. You think about, in my country, the suffragettes, you go back even further uh, to the ending of uh, slavery. Most of that was nonviolent, but every so often something would happen that would be quite provocative. And you, in, in, in my own country, you see it from people overturning the statues representing slavery and colonial, colonial history. The historical part of my being thinks that's fantastic. You know, people, people are now increasingly aware of what's going on and, and what needs to change. But then you see the idiocies on the edges of it. I mean, the Beatles in, 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 in the 60s um, did a song called Penny Lane uh, yesterday, I think. That was painted out and people said, no, racist. Well, Penny Lane has nothing to do with the guy who was called Penny, P-E-N-N-E-Y, who was a slave trafficker. And so it... it Violence quite quickly or, or, or aggression quite quickly goes to stupidity um, so, or ill-informed Ill action. So I think it's complicated and, and I would love to be a lot more nonviolent than I am. I would love to be in, uh, you know, embrace nonviolence uh, more than I've been able to do to date. And partly that's understanding. Um, yeah, I think India is the most extraordinary place. Um, you know, I, 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 I not been there that often, but I've been there often enough to love it in all of its complexity and its frustrations. And I think India over time has so much to offer the wider world. And I think one critical part of that is the tradition of and the practices of nonviolence. And I think, uh, I think you and I in a conversation have wondered sometimes whether you know, it's overly associated with Gandhi. I, I don't think that's possible. I think, I think these extraordinary champions in history model things that we all need to uh, learn from. But equally, it, it shouldn't be confined to um, this sort of strange person all those years ago who, who would carry his um, spinning wheel with him and take a goat and so on. Um, uh, 
which I think again was a provocation. I think it was also done in humor and, and um, with an understanding of how you change systems, which is sometimes you, you provoke uh, most successfully when you do it in a playful way, when you do it almost like a child. Um, you, you trigger a different set of responses from uh, the forces of order. Now I'm 70. Uh, I think the next 10 to 15 years of my life, you know, if I'm granted them, um, are going to be by far the most exciting, by far the most challenging, and by far the most dangerous of my entire life uh, to date. And I mean that. I mean, I, I think we are moving into a period of profound and disruptive change. Uh, our current leadership uh, cohorts are really not up to uh, a scratch in, in what now needs to happen. So I think by 2030, we will see the world being led and guided uh, by a very different set of people who we've largely never heard of. And I think that's both exciting, but they'll have to make their mistakes along the way. And I'm, so I'm not saying let the youngsters do it. I'm, I'm saying that this is a pan-generational challenge. It's a pan-generational project. And, 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 and uh, people like me and youngsters like you have really got to sort of help <laughs> the, um, you know, the, 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 the people who really will drive uh, change to do that and do it in a kindly way wherever they can but recognizing that disruption is never easy and there will always be losers. And we've got to recognize where the loss is gonna happen and, and step in and embrace uh, those challenges and try and address them as best we can. But exciting, challenging, and I'm afraid uh, dangerous. Thank you so much.